Welcome to the webinar on uh, continuous improvement uh, for breeding. My name is Dan Makumbi. I'm a maize breeder uh, with the CIMIT based in Kenya. I'll be uh, hosting this uh, webinar today on behalf of uh, uh, Bish Das. He's not about to be in this webinar because he had just had a baby yesterday. So we congratulate him on that. So today's webinar is hosted by the CGIR Excellence in Breeding Platform, the Accelerated Genetic Gains in Maize and Wheat, and the High Rise uh, Project. So uh, in today's webinar, we'll have experts from the experts on continuous improvement and guest presenters from Erie and the Syngenta. We will, have in, uh, we will have some presentations, and then after all the presentations are, are done, we will have uh, a discussion uh, session where we'll have questions and, and answers. For the participants, uh, if you need to put on your camera, that's okay, but uh, try to make sure that you are on mute as much as possible so that uh, all the partners have uh, only the voice coming from the presenters. As a matter of housekeeping, uh, the, there will be a recording of the of the webinar, so it can it will be accessible to to the participants after after the, the webinar. So uh, we hope that you enjoy uh, listening to the experts, and uh, uh, and hopefully you will find something that you can use in your relevant in your different breeding programs to make your work better and more efficiently. Okay, the high rise project uh, for the partners in Africa, the high rise project is about developing high, high, high yielding uh, rice varieties in East and West Africa. It's led by EIB and uh, it, uh, through this project, they work with 18 hours on seven in seven key rice producing countries. So we'll not go too much into too much details on that, but uh, I'm sure the EIB team can provide more information if you need to get to, to do that. So let's get started. And I will introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. B.M. Prasanna. Dr. Prasanna is the director of the Global Maize Breeding Program at CIMIT and is also the director of the Global CGIR Research Program on Maize, sorry, uh, which is a CGIR alliance of more than 300 uh, research and development institutions. Uh, Dr. Prasanna has been at CIMIT for more than 10 years and He will be representing uh, the accelerated, accelerated genetic gains in maize and wheat project. So Dr. Prasanna, you are welcome to make your opening remarks uh, for this webinar. Mute, Prasanna. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thanks a lot, EAB colleagues, uh, especially Bish and Gustavo for inviting uh, me for this uh, important webinar. Uh, the Accelerated Genetic Gains Project, um, together with High Rises, as Dan introduced, uh, is hosting this webinar. Uh, the AGG project, especially the maize component of the project, uh, works with partner institutions uh, in 13 countries across Sub Saharan Africa, uh, including five countries from Eastern Africa, four from Southern Africa and uh, four from West Africa. Uh, we are very happy to partner with the High Rise Project uh, implemented by the Excellence in Breeding Platform under the Crops to End Hunger Initiative, uh, which I understand is working with again, eight uh, major NARS breeding programs in seven different uh, rice producing countries in East and West Africa. Both these projects in fact share a common goal that is uh, how to introduce the best practices and technologies uh, to accelerate the development and delivery of improved varieties. Um, maize, wheat, and rice are the three major crops targeted by these two projects. 
and they are really go to the meeting the calorie requirements and the nutritional requirements besides uh, food security incomes and livelihoods of millions of smallholder farmers across africa and asia uh, so ultimately the varieties that we develop have to meet the needs of these farmers their families as well as the consumers uh, the agg and high rise projects again have another uh, shared objective that is to strengthen the capacities of local institutions especially the national programs uh, in the key area of modern breeding that is breeding program modernization this includes right from how to design and develop and implement uh, demand driven uh, product profiles and breeding approaches uh, using quantitative genetic principles to optimize the breeding schemes uh, including the testing locations the tester strategies uh, the way in which we move from one stage to another stage uh, in the breeding cycle and uh, how to recycle the best of the lines in our breeding programs to deliver on, deliver on the targeted product profiles we are also uh, validating and utilizing new tools and technologies uh, to accelerate the breeding cycles the genetic gain as well as to reduce the cost and time to develop new elite lines or varieties these include for instance in case of maize the double haploidy the high throughput and precise phenotyping uh, genomic selection based breeding uh, as well as mechanization uh, and digitization of our operations so gustavo is going to talk more about how to improve the breeding operations using mechanization to reduce the costs and to improve the experimental data and of course uh, to implement a modern breeding program we also need to have a well set a well established uh, breeding data management system and the bioinformatics capacity uh, finally it's uh, all, all this cannot sorry A mute prasanna at me okay <laughs> okay uh, all these aspects that i just talked about uh, cannot be accomplished overnight we do recognize that the partner institutions especially the national programs go through several challenges uh, some of them are technical challenges some of them are logistic challenges manpower challenges uh, and to mainstream these new tools and technologies effectively uh, we need to foster a culture of continuous improvement and that's the reason why this present webinar is about it's about what is continuous improvement and how do we foster uh, a culture of continuous improvement through these projects so uh, again public private partnerships are key for us to achieve this uh, we need to learn a lot from the uh, large commercial breeding programs which have been uh, uh, undertaking modernized breeding programs for several decades so we have a lot to learn from institutions uh, which have been implementing this and that's the reason why we have the pleasure of having marcelo uh, who is in syngenta uh, talking to us about how syngenta uh, implements a modern breeding program so uh, the present webinar is in fact uh, one amongst the series of webinars we have organized in the last 2 to 3 months uh, including a webinar on high throughput uh, phenotyping then we followed it up with uh, genomic selection as uh, in genomics assisted breeding maize breeding and the third one which we organized was on seed systems especially on accelerated varietal replacement uh, in sub saharan africa so we are very glad to uh, co-host this with uh, high rise with irvi with uh, excellence in breeding platform and once again i request you to all be uh, thoroughly engaged in this next one and a half hours or so and uh, benefit from this uh, experience of learned colleagues who is going to are going to make presentations during this webinar thanks a lot and i look forward to a very exciting uh, webinar thanks uh, thank you prasanna for those uh, good opening remarks now we we'll get into the details of uh, the of uh, continuous improvement so we'll start with the principles well let's welcome uh, gustavo texera 
who is the lead of the operations and phenotyping module at the Excellence in Breeding platform. Uh, Gustavo leads uh, in initiatives to improve the CGR and the NAS capacities. He's an expert in agricultural engineering processes, mechanization and, automa and automation. He has over 15 years of experience uh, in the private sector where he has worked as automation manager for R&D in Latin America at Syngenta. Welcome, Gustavo. Thanks, Dan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, so thanks, 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 Prasanna. Thanks all for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to organize with, uh, with Dan, with um, Bish, um, this webinar. It's, um, we really believe that this is a real good, um, that what, the things that you learn today, it's really, you will see good things to help you to, to uh, would support you to improve your uh, breeding programs. Um, so I will uh, present to you the introduction or why we are here today and why we believe that this is important. Okay. So uh, first, uh, what's EIB? I don't know if uh, all of you is, is aware about EIB, but EIB is the Excellence in Breeding Platform. It's a, a CGIR platform. And uh, as Prasenna said, we have, uh, we cover most of the areas in the breeding programs from product definition to breeding schemes, genotyping, breeding operation and phenotyping and IT and bioinformatics. So I'm, I'm the leader of uh, module four that is breeding operation and phenotyping. In this module, we have uh, one goal that is members of, or, or the, to support uh, platform members uh, breeding programs to have the most cost efficient phenotypic process from field preparation to data collection. So our goal is really to, to support breeding programs to have a really good plot, really good, good data, okay, in a, in a cost effective uh, manner, okay? So this is our goal. In order to achieve that, we have uh, in, um, in module four, some areas that we provide support from agronomic practices, seed processing, planting and harvesting, phenotyping, and the last but not least, that is probably beyond, not probably, but it's beyond module four, but it's super important for module four, is the continuous improvement. And today you will understand a little bit more what we uh, understand about continuous improvement and what we hope that, to achieve with continuous improvement. Okay, so this is a really important component for our strategy to support you. Okay, so why we need to have this continuous improvement? And what's, what is our goal? Okay, last year we had, uh, uh, every year EIB, uh, Excellence in Breeding, um, we have a meeting, or our annual meeting when we, we joined with the the deputy directors from CGIR centers, head of breeding, funders, and also including also the national partners. In the last year, we, we met together uh, and we decided or def agreed on what would be the vision for a modern breeding program, what a, what a modern breeding program looks like. So this, and we, we define key components of that. And as Prasanna said, uh, culture of continuous improvement was identified in, in the, and you can find this uh, document in um, ex, at excellencybreed.org. And you can find this document and you see one of the pillars for that is the cultures of continuous improvement. I mean, 
how to really always think in, uh, to improve. And we, uh, we uh, have, uh, and you see today, some methodologies, some practices that helps you to, to prioritize, helps you to make the next step. Okay, so this is the contest uh, or why. And, um, but what do we mean about continuous improvement? What, what it, it really means? And I will uh, pass this to, to Dan and to introduce Theresa. And Theresa Heitman will explain you a little bit more on the tail. Okay, thanks, uh, Dan. Uh, thanks, Gustavo. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Theresa Heitman. She's a continuous improvement consultant at Experiential Excellence LLC, which is based in the US. She has been leading continuous improvement processes and trainings with EIB and partners. She's, uh, Teresa is an experienced certified lean practitioner and Sigma Six uh, belt, black belt trainer. She has spent 12 years working with Monsanto. So welcome, Teresa, for your, to make your presentation. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, and you can see my screen. Thank you very much for the introduction and I'm excited to talk with everybody today a little bit about continuous improvement and the continuous improvement methodology, which we have been using in with, with EIB for um, the organizations that work with EIB. So we're talking about developing a culture of continuous improvement. How do we do that? Well, we start with what the purpose is of your organization. So we always discuss this when we start, what is the purpose of your organization? And we need to understand that so that we can um, meet the needs of our customer. Generally, organizations exist to serve their customer. That's, that's what the, your, your, the need for your organization is. We need to find out what it is that our customer needs. What do they need? We've got to talk to them directly and ask them what they need. Also, um, thinking about customer, a lot of times we think about our direct uh, customer that we're, we are producing a product or a service for. But when we, when we think about um, our systems and our processes, we also think about customer as whoever is the next step in the process. So not only do we have that external customer who we ultimately have to meet their need, but we also have needs and requirements from each customer who is a step in the process. So kind of keep that in mind as well as we um, go through this um, presentation. So your external customer, as I understand, um, one of their major needs, and they probably have many more, but is to eliminate poverty and hunger. So our organization exists to serve our customer who has a need of eliminating poverty and hunger. How are we going to do that? How are we going to eliminate poverty and hunger? And you, many of you have been working in this industry for many, many years. So you're, you're very familiar with continually improving the productivity of, of the crops that you were breeding. That's what it's all about, right? It's all about continuous improvement, getting more yield, um, better quality crops. We're continually improving the agronomic management of our processes. So we're used to this and we're used to thinking about how do we get better? Sometimes it's, um, it's difficult though to 
think about and, and look at all the processes that have to take place that help us to get continually better. And, and we want to get better as quickly as we can so we can solve our customer's problem. So we talk about developing a culture of continuous improvement. And this is um, something that we have to have a long-term view of. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, many of us have had experiences over our lifetime with cultures, right? And culture, um, it takes a while to develop. And we have to be very consistent in our uh, practices. And we have to always send the right message. And we, I always say we kind of um, change one person at a time. Uh, if one person has, has a positive experience and they come to respect and, and believe the, the process that we're using to uh, continuously improve, then we have started to change that culture and the way that they look at their work and others' work. So if we stay focused on the customer and you know, when we, we go back to, you know, why does our organization exist? What's the purpose? It's, it's for that customer. We want to identify that, that customer needs and we want to deliver value to the customer. When we talk about um, continuous improvement and adding value to our customer, everything that we do, we want to ensure that that adds value to our customer. So we have to kind of develop a mindset here, first of all, that we're, we're going to change. We've got to open ourselves up. Um, we are going to change and we're going to learn how to change. We've created a world that is a product of our thinking today. And it cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So that's what we're talking about changing our thinking, changing the way that we look at the world. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Many of you have probably seen these optical illusions where sometimes you see a young woman in this picture and sometimes you see an old woman. It depends on the way that you're looking at the picture. Change starts from inside us. We have to, you know, we have to have an intrinsic desire to change and improve and grow. If you want your outside life to change, you first have to start with your mindset. Start learning how to learn, how to form new habits, how to, how to learn new skills, and stop repeating what's not working. So... Um, this is, you know, everything that we're talking about, learning about a different way to look at our systems and our processes. So what does a continuous improvement culture look like? Well, first of all, <laughs> culture trumps everything, right? You've probably seen this before. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. So keep in mind that it is all about the culture and grooming that culture and developing that culture. Um, we can learn all the tools to make our processes efficient and take less time, but unless we have actually changed the way people are thinking and change, changing that culture to always thinking about the customer and what that customer's need is, um, we're going to have a hard time sustaining the continuous improvement in our organization. However, there are a lot of core elements in, in a continuous improvement culture, and these are some of them. We won't take a lot of time to discuss them, but just know that these are some key things that have to be present. Number one, just like any initiative, right? Leadership commitment. We must have our leaders um, understanding continuous improvement and, and um, supporting that. Organizational commitment. 
from the rest of the organization. You know, let's change our mindset. Let's, let's give this thing a try. Let's see how it works. Focus on customer needs. Always focus on what your customer needs. Be customer centric and do, do only in your processes what adds value to your customer as much as possible. We need to have an improvement strategy. So right from the top, um, we need to have that strategy and you know, and the EIB does, as you just saw from what Gustavo had showed in the pillars of uh, the uh, modern breeding program. We, people need to have access to training and learning um, so that they can, they have the tools and the knowledge that they need to change their work. They need to have the equipment, physical environment, um, standard work, you know, what is the best way that we know how to do things today? And we start from there and we improve on that. And we also, this is very key, the people performing the work are the best ones to improve the work. They generally, they know the what is go, not going right in their work and they, they have many times raised questions about that. Can we change this? I need to have this equipment to do my job better, but um, they maybe have not had the authority to make those changes. In a continuous improvement culture, we, we trust them, we respect the people doing the work to be able to make those improvements. And we want everybody involved every day, everyone thinking about how they can take care of their customer better. Um, change management, how do we change things, how do we implement and how do we sustain? And then we also need to measure ourselves. So what, you've heard this before as well, I'm sure, what gets measured gets managed. Now you, you probably have heard about a lot of different continuous improvement methodologies, um, process improvement methodologies, these are some of them. And I just wanted to, you know, show you that you've probably heard about these things. We have uh, made the decision to focus on the lean improvement methodology at this point in time. It is a, a, a very close relative to the Toyota production system. And it is a methodology that the, the tools in it are very um, universal and easy for everybody to learn and use. So Lean is a system for developing a continual improvement way of thinking. And I like to think of Lean also as an uh, organizational growth strategy where we satisfy the customer and we, we, we meet the customer's needs, we get the product to them when they need it, it's the amount they need at the right price, using a minimum of material, space, labor, and time. And when we do that, we actually use fewer resources to create what the customer needs. And we can take those resources that have been freed up and we can apply them to growing our business, growing our organization, doing more, um, delivering things faster. Another thing about Lean is it's unique as a management approach, which I mentioned before. Um, it doesn't aim to tell people what to think or what to do, but how to think about things. So they come up with their own ideas, insights, and initiatives. Lean is about people. The best people to improve the process are the people working in the process. Respect and trust are paramount in lean. Trust the people who are doing the work to be able to improve the way that you're doing the work. So we work in teams a lot in, in lean and, and we recognize that in teams we have, we bring a lot of diversity and thought and experience and we can do more, we can accomplish more as a team than we can individually. Lean is continuous, uh, evolutionary process of change and adaptation. It, we don't do it just once, it's a vision. Um, it, people talk about being on a journey. 
It's a way that we learn how to manage our business through this thinking process. So real quickly, there are you know, several goals of Lean. We want to improve quality for our customer in every way. We want to do things right the first time. And if we find that we have made an, uh, an error um, or we have an opportunity for improvement, we want to solve that problem right away. We want to eliminate all non-value added um, activities and processes. And we, we call these waste. So you mostly talk about people uh, reducing and eliminating waste. Also, very we would like to deliver to our customer products and services as fast as we can. And I just heard you talk about um, implementing some mechanization to the breeding schemes, modernizing the breeding schemes. We can reduce the lead time that it takes to develop a new product for a customer by implementing some of these new methodologies. And then you'll deliver quicker to your customer. And we also overall reduce total costs. There, so there are five principles of lean. First, we want to define the value as the customer, what the customer's view is on value. We map our process. Then we create flow in our process. We um, establish pull from our customer, making only what our customer asks us to make when they want it. And we continually seek perfection. So we have a plan for continually improving. These are the five principles of lean. So pretty simple. We just move through this process as we're reducing and eliminating waste and solving problems. And we're just gonna quickly go through each one. There, there are, and you may have, have known this, but there are many tools and methods that we use in lean. Um, but I just wanna stress that lean is a, about the way you're thinking these tools and methods help you work through to solve problems. So in each one of these steps in this process, there are a number of tools that we generally use that, that help us. In defined value, we have voice of the customer. We're defining what's critical to the customer. And from what's critical to the customer, what does that mean for our organization? What do we have to do what's critical to quality to meet their need. We're gonna map that value stream in several ways. We're gonna map the, the to overall value stream. We're gonna map individual processes, um, different types of maps for different types of problems. We're gonna create flow. How can we get things through our system quicker? What, is, what are the barriers? What are the things holding us back? What are the problems that we're having? And what can we do to overcome them? And then we want to figure out how we can just make what the customer needs when they need it. How, what is their rate of demand? How do we need to add resources in certain process steps so that we don't have bottlenecks? That type of thing. And how do we continually improve? What's our next plan to get better? You have a vision. You have a vision for your breeding programs. It's, it's a few years out. You're not gonna get there all at once. So in, in, uh, in our thought process, one of the things we have to really think about is what is our current state? And we do a lot of work on our current state because when we look at that current state, we can identify all the problems in that current state. And then we look for solutions. So there's gonna be many next target conditions along this path to your vision. And those are those improvement iterations. You may be familiar with what we call the scientific method. A lot of us learned this, I think I learned this in junior high school. Um, the plan, do, study, act. We're planning. Now we're, what we're going to do to make improvements we're going to implement those improvements and, and study that. Did it work? Has, have our numbers gotten better? Is our customer more satisf satisfied? And then we're gonna make some adjustments 
And this is an iterative cycle. And as we move through it continually, we will get better and better. There's a few um, tools I wanted to kind of show you. Most of the tools in Lean are very um, straightforward. We can describe them easily and working as a team um, can complete these tools and gain a lot of insight. In the defined value, um, this is called a um, critical to customer, critical to quality. So we, we, we list out who our customers are. There are generally several. What are that all of those customers' needs? And what is critical in our organization in order to meet those customers' needs? How are we going to do this right side of this diagram? And this is actually a um, diagram that was done by one of our improvement teams in, the, in Erie. This is one of our types of maps. That's called a spaghetti map. It happens to be my favorite kind of map. But we can map material flows, people flows, and information flows. This group, which is a, a, one of the, the bioservices lab groups in CIMIT in Mexico, um, did this map. It was taking eight weeks for them to have their lab equipment maintained in order to get service when it was not working. And if they just reorganize their work, if they re-look at the information flow, and I shouldn't say just, this isn't e necessarily easy to accomplish, but they figured they could get that lead time down to three weeks. That's more than a 50% improvement. A lot of times when we look at our processes the first time, we can make a 50% improvement. This is called a fishbone um, cause and effect diagram. We're looking at our resources. We find variation in our resources, in our equipment, our people, our environment, materials, and methods. What is causing this lack of equipment maintenance? We talk about that as a team, identify those causes, and then we look for solutions to those causes. We'll have an implementation plan. This is called a lean action plan. How are we gonna establish pull in our process and how are we going to improve it in the future? And I've just circled a few of their um, areas where they're focused on those establishing pull and seeking perfection. So when we're, when we're talking about thinking about what can, what can improve, we want to identify everything that we would classify as non-value added in our, in our processes. We only want to do things that add value to our customer. So anything we're doing, not adding value, let's take a look at. And there are generally eight ways that we look at that where there is not activity taking place, which is not adding value. And believe it or not, <laughs> 95% um, of what we do in our processes does not add value. And this is across all industries of what, they've, what we've found over the years. 95%. Now, that's hard to believe. But just last week, I was uh, working with the, with the EIB team, actually. They have taken the initiative to go through the lean uh, course. And one of the processes they were working on, they found out when they mapped the process that they only had 7% of their time, of the lead time, was value added. So that was very eye-opening. Anyway, we're looking for um, non-value added or waste. We're looking for it in transportation. Are we moving things around? Nothing's happening. Nothing is changing the form or function of what we're making when things are being transported. And we also, they're also open up to um, um, possible damage as they're being transported. Inventory, excess motion, people walking around, um, material moving around, waiting. Nothing's happening while we're waiting. Overproduction, are we making more than what the next step in the process is asking for over processing defects things that are just not correct when they come off the line 
and underutilized talent. If we have a lot of waste in our process, we have people who have talents to do other things that are their time is spent solving problems rather than creating new products or new processes. So here's a few quick examples of some waste. So we're transporting things. Nothing's changing the form or function of what we're making. Inventory. We have a, when we have too much inventory, we have a lot of cash tied up. We have a lot of management that has to take place to keep inventory in the right place on the shelves. We have a lot of processes to prove that we have the inventory on hand physically that says we have on paper. And you know we have to have a lot of space to store it. Warehousing is expensive. If we don't have our process lined up in, in the correct order of that steps occur, we have a lot of excess motion, a lot of walking around. I um, worked with a, with a research station one time who was simply laying out samples for the breeders to um, come through and make their notes on. And we discovered that the people in the process were, were walking eight miles in a day to lay out these samples and to take them to the, the seed processing line. Just by a simple um, spaghetti diagram that we just saw a few minutes ago, um, we mapped out the flow of the people and the material. And just by then showing the people working in the process what that spaghetti diagram looked like, they came up with some ideas in a matter of two days, they came up with ideas of things that they, came, they could change to lay out their process differently and they reduced their motion by 80%, that excess motion. That gained them about an hour and 20 minutes a day of time when they either could do more work if they chose or they could go home and spend with their family. Lisa, sorry, two more minutes, okay? Thank okay. you. This is the, this is the uh, waste of waiting. These people are waiting for a COVID-19 test the waste of overproduction, making more than the customer asked for. And this was a um, story about making more corn syrup than the customer can need, than cannot the customer asked for. That product going out of condition over uh, the summertime in the US and having to reprocess all of that corn syrup, tank, tank cars beyond tank cars to meet the customer need. Rework, no value add. Sometimes we over-engineer. Our customer needs a bicycle and we build them a rocket ship. That's called over-processing. Sometimes we have defects where we accidentally spray our crops with the wrong chemical that they're not uh, tolerant of and we have lost all of the effort that we have put into that, that whole um, breeding process for maybe an entire year and the waste of people's talents. So those are the eight wastes that we're looking for in our processes. And as we teach people about those wastes, they, they get it and they see it all over the place and um, they take action to reduce it. So um, from, from, you know, now we're down to how can we support the national programs and, and other programs and continuous improvement? So if you have access to the Excellence in Breeding website, we now have um, a lot of our, our improvement tools and methods are published on that website. And there will be more shortly coming there. Um, also, so we have that today and you have access to that information. And these are some of the continuous improvement tools and methods that are out there. They're very simple. Um, hopefully the information is easy to understand. And then coming soon, um, we're going to be having all of this information on the learning management system that's being implemented and planning on having some um, webinar type uh, sessions for learning topics. And then also turning this information now that's in PowerPoint presentations into uh, training videos. 
that's all I have for today. Dan? Losing Teresa? It appears we are losing Teresa, right? Hello, Teresa. Yes, I am finished. I am finished. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for that nice presentation, Teresa. I hope uh, the participants have taken off note of the waste, the eight. Okay. Now let's hear from the private sector in our next presentation. Let me introduce Marcelo Almeida. Marcelo is a Syngenta's seed business improvement lead. He's a statistician and an American Society for Quality Certified Master Black Belt. He has led organizations to implement and deploy continuous improvement for 25 years. He's experienced in using Lean Six Sigma methodologies to increase efficiency and customer satisfaction in a range of industries, including oil and gas, automotive, chemicals, and agriculture. Let's welcome Marcelo. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you also, uh, Theresa, it was a wonderful presentation. I will try to keep up, <laughs> not easy. <clears throat> uh, and thank you, uh, Gustavo and everybody for this opportunity, it's an honor. Uh, and first of all, I'm speaking by myself as a, a experienced, experienced lean practitioner. That's all I am. I'm not speaking on, be, on behalf of Syngenta specifically. I will share a lot of experience. Uh, and if you have any doubts, please let me know. Okay, let me share my screen. Very fast here. Okay, okay. Just a second. Presenting mode. Okay. Okay, okay. So, oops, sorry. First of all, talking about building a, a workplace culture of continuous improvement. Uh, sorry, we need to, to understand that before anything, it's a, like Teresa said, it's, it's about behavior, okay? Even, even before we talk about tools and methodology that sometimes scary people a little bit, but we hear people complaining about all of the problems and issues and how, how many work they have to do and little time, uh, but when we approach trying to help them to make it faster, easier, and faster as a consequence, what, I, what we hear most is, no thanks, <laughs> we're too busy. We don't have time for that. So working in continuous improvement is investing time to make your life better, to make your life easier. So that's the first message that we need to deliver to everybody involved in a new continuous improvement program or even in a continuous improvement project. So we're talking about how people think, what, what's important for them and how, how they're going to behave. Okay, this is very key, guys, to not only for a specific project, but also deploying a, a continuous improvement future. And that is for agriculture, <laughs> chemicals, going gas, all over the place, all kinds of industries and processes, okay? This is very important. We need to touch the, 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 the guys, we need to touch the people in, in, their, in their, the way they think, okay? So they can change the behavior. Uh, because we want to change the behavior, when, it, when you're deploying, when you're trying to build the a new culture, we're trying to change the culture to a continuous improvement culture. We need to have the involvement, I would say the commitment of the leadership. So people that lead the process, the bosses, they need to, to lead by example. They need to be more than involved. They need to be committed to that, okay? 
So uh, from my past experience, what we used to do is we find the main problems we have, identify them, we prioritize them, and then we choose, we pick some of them to work on these problems to make the process better, more efficient, faster, as a consequence in being simpler, okay? When we have that, then we involve those leaders in, in, in the project by supporting, not necessarily running the projects, but being present, asking questions, uh, moving roadblocks, trying to help and support and understand what's going on, okay? So this is the first step of deploying a new program. Uh, just in a sequence, we need also to involve the people that's part of the process or <laughs> leave the hell of the problem. So it's suffering with the problem. Those people, they need to have their, their voice, their voice uh, listened. They need to have opportunity to be part of the improving process. Okay, and that's, that's what it, it means, empower employees. So give the people, give the employees opportunity to be part of this improvement project, improvement process. Okay, how to make things easier. The, mo the main goal of those projects is, I need to make my life better by making the things I do easier, simpler, and as a consequence, being faster and more efficient, okay? After that, we need to uh, communicate as well. We need to share what we are doing and what we are discovering and what we are changing so we can uh, kind of contagiate people with good, the good, the good uh, energy of making things better. So we incentivate others to not copy necessarily, but try to find out how they can do better. And sometimes why not copy a solution or, or copy an, an understanding of the problem. Okay, this communicating is very important. Not only communicating the project individually, but the approach, the problem, the, this future change, this behavior change of continuous improvement. Let's do things better. Let's try to make things differently. So communication is key also to everybody in, in the program and understands and has the opportunity to try to be involved in work in all ideas because all ideas matters, okay? Uh, as a fourth step, we, we recommend that try to keep it simple at the beginning at least. Sometimes we want to jump to fancy solutions, fancy complex tools and methodologies. Uh, Theresa was very kind to share with us a, a huge list of tools and methodologies. Many of them are very simple, very easy to, to execute and implement, but some of them are a little bit complex. What you need to find out is simple problems, simple tools, complex, complex problems, complex tools. So when we start to look at the process, what we're gonna see most of the time is very simple problems happening. We just need to change the glasses, we need to, to start learning to see what's going on there, learning to see all the ways that Theresa kindly shared with us. All those ways are in, that, are in our life so frequently we, and we don't see it all the time all the time, okay? So, and, and, and then the fifth step is, as we start to change the processes, as we start to move things, to change things, measure that, share with all, and celebrate. So measure the impact. And not necessarily it's money. Most of the time is time, number of people that we need, or how many plants we could harvest or count seeds that we could count or, or hectares that we could apply something. So we need to understand 
What's the impact of the change that you are making? That's very important. And share and celebrate the, what we conquer. This is very important. That motivates us. We are human beings, first of all. So we need, we need recognition. That's, that's very important. Okay? So I would like to share our experience, our approach, when we start to look through the first initial projects that we did here in my company, in our a company that I work for, sorry. Uh, when you look through the processes, usually what we're trying to see, for example, we could say, um, there is a, we need to plant faster. The first idea that came to our minds usually is, I need a fast tractor. Am I right? Or I need a new, more technology or a new uh, uh, planter with a GPS integrated and, and with a lot of new technologies that's gonna help us to plant faster. But the thing is, if, it, if we look to that process, if we observe well, we're gonna see that like the green parts here, we only spent few moments of the day really adding value or executing the main task. That is planting, that's putting the seed on the ground. We spend a lot of time setting up the process, waiting for seeds, uh, waiting uh, to, to, to fill up the, 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 the tank gas of the tractor, or preparing to plant, or after we plant, organizing every, everything to put in a truck and go to another, another field. So we spend a lot of time not adding value. And the main opportunities are there on trying to make our life simpler and not spend that much time in activities that are waste. So that's the main idea, that's the main thing, okay? So let me share on, on a specific patch of experience with you guys. We're talking about a lot of tools and methods and concepts. How could we implement that? How could we, we tangibilize that. This story is about soybean crossing. We had this challenge. Our challenge was to, uh, sorry, to uh, finish all soil crossings of many, many plants in just one week. And we have only four persons, four persons. When you look to the amount of soy plants that we have to cross, we make this math very quick and, start, and see that, well, we would need 388 hours of work, the way we were, we were used to, to do the job. But just look into the historical data. But we have only four persons with an average of 40 hours per, per week, which it means like eight hours per day. So we have available 160 hours of work only. That was the challenge. So then we realized, wow, we need to cross faster. So we need to cross, making the crossing faster. So things, people started to think how it could be faster, moving faster. Then, then we said, no, 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 no. It's not about moving faster. It's working is smarter with less waste. Waste, okay? So what we did was, let's like step two, we were there and we observed the process. When we were observing the process, we could see that most of the time the person was not crossing this, the soybean plant. But a huge part of the time people were uh, tying the plant or what we call staking the soybean plant. Tying the plant into a stake in, in, in the vase to keep the soybean plant straight. That activity was stealing our time, our crossing time. So we spent a lot of time tying the plant and untying, tying and untying. So then we start to ask ourselves, why we need that? Oh, well, we need to, to, to let the plant, the soybean plant straight. But why we use tying of course, why we knew why we did that like this? Then we realized, can we do this simpler, faster? How can this make? How can we 
tie the plant in a way that is simpler and faster as a consequence. Then we waste less time just tying and tying the plants. Then we have a person there, a, a girl with a very long hair that ensures wearing like a hair clip. Then we look at her and then we got the idea. We realized that, well, what about we, instead of tying the plant, we hold the plant with this hair clip. And then we test it. Then we bought, we bought more hair clips to, to have been making more tests. Then with those, with that very minor change, we, we could increase the, process, the crossing process speed in 2.5. We were 2.5 times faster. And just by simplifying the staking process by not more tying and, and then just holding the plant with a hair clip, we, we achieved the main target that we saw here at the beginning with just four persons. We, we could cross all those plants that were supposed to spend 388 hours in just 155 hours. Okay, just very quick. Let me share with you guys. Sorry, a fast video here just to see what I'm talking about. Sometimes an image is way better than a thousand words. So guys, this is a time process. First, the person has to cut in pieces and then came to the plant and tie the plant in the state here. Sorry about the video, it's not a professional one. We just take, we just took the, the cell phone and, and, and film it. Simpler, okay? So see, that's what we're talking about. That is the staking, sorry being staking. Okay, and the change was coming from that to executing like this. And this, this guys, this video was the first time we tried it. <laughs> so the person that was trying that was piloting, was making the, the proof, was the first time that this person was holding the plants using a hair clip. So after many times that they were performing this, this activity, it got even faster. That's why we achieved 2.5 faster. Okay. Sorry. Just a moment, let me come back. Okie dokie. So sometimes we think about making improvement projects, projects like fancy, a lot of technology. I'm not saying that sometimes we're gonna need more technology, that sometimes we're gonna need to spend money, to invest money to take uh, a better uh, efficiency, efficiency or effectiveness. That's very important to understand. Sometimes we're going to need it, some investment, but then you're going to need the investment, but you're going to know where specifically where to invest. But many, many times with simple initiatives and making people that suffer the problem, suffer the pain of the problem, being part of the investigation and the solution can make it simple uh, improvements with huge impacts. Okay. Just to analyze, uh, as a program, we started with, oh, sorry, we started with specific needs, like I said, grabbing some specific challenges or problems and working it, involving leaders and people that's part of the process. After we have these success stories, we started to, sorry, we launched our program, continuous improvement program, we transformed that in those initially only initiatives on a program. And with training, training practitioners, lean practitioners, and, and I was one of the uh, instructors and coaching them to keep running improvement projects. After dozens of projects, 
we start to realize that we would, we, would, we would need finally to use a little bit more complex tools and methodologies. And now we are in an evolution where we are integrating more methods, not only lean tools, but also Six Sigma, Agile, Design Think, so all kinds of tools that can, have, can help us better to work on those main challenges we, we are facing now. Okay, so that's, that's what I have to, to, to present. Hope I uh, thank you help so some much. Time. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for that nice presentation. Uh, let's switch to uh, hear about a case study from a research uh, institute. Let's welcome Sharifa, who is the head of integrative research support program at IRI in the Philippines. Sharifa works to build the IRI's research for development, education, and capacity building programs and leads the collaborative relationship building. Sharifa has more than 15 years of experience in the palm oil industry. Uh, including a stint as Senior Vice President for Research and Development Cluster of FGV Holdings, Bad Malaysia. Uh, welcome, Sharifa. Thank you, Dan. Can you see my slide? Yes, you can see. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, and thank you to Gustavo for inviting me here to speak today. And thank you to Marcelo and Teresa for the wonderful presentation. And I hope I could do um, as well as, the, as them. So I'm, uh, my presentation is basically about sharing our experience. We just, a um, couple of months back, we just finished our training and also working on projects together with Gustavo and Teresa, and um, that's what I'll be sharing today. So I would like to start off by kind of explaining our role, the role of uh, our platform in IRI's research strategy. Um, basically, um, we have just made some uh, restructuring and we have three um, research platforms basically in IRI. One is the rice breeding, which um, look at rice breeding, obviously, and upstream sciences and sustainable rice, um, and the other platform is sustainable rice-based agri-food system, which are in charge of agronomy type of research and policy. And the third platform is our platform, which is the integrative research support platform. Uh, our platform's role is to provide research support to ERI HQ um, and, and across the global ERI. Um, this means basically is that all the research operations are done um, in our platform. So. Um, uh, uh, in particular, uh, breeding operations. Uh, everything is done by us, starting from hybridization, goes all the way to uh, yield trials and so on. So we conducted it. So um, our aim is to be a best-in-class integrated research support system by cultivating a culture of excellence in the delivery of research services and support. Now, our uh, platform has um, six units. Uh, cross-cutting operations, uh, which provides breeding operation support from hybridization, as I was saying, all the way to yield trial, uh, seed processing, seed storage, it's here as well. Uh, the next cluster is um, IRI service labs, which is basically our chemistry and genotyping team, uh, research infrastructure and regulatory compliance. Hey, what's going on? Hang on. Okay. Um, Research infrastructure and regulatory compliance cluster is responsible for transgenic research stewardship and research infrastructure. Then we have seed health unit for seed health and logistics. Um, uh, software development um, uh, looks at the B4R and EBS development and other IT research support. And finally, uh, Ziegler Experimental Station um, looks at, um, is in charge of the experimental field, uh, field machineries and greenhouses operations and so on. And we operate based on full cost recovery, which means that each and every one of our services has a cost to it, which is paid by the researchers requesting for those services. So in essence, we are actually operating like a business unit where customer satisfaction is paramount. Um, so this translates the key elements of continuous improvement, which is quality, delivery, um, uh, timely delivery, that means uh, turnaround time and a cost. 
So how did we get started in this journey? Um, we had, um, uh, I joined IRI last September and there's already talk about from the rice breeding platform leader to um, look into implementing some of these uh, methodologies um, in our processes to make it more efficient. And then early this year, we had, uh, I had some discussion with Gustavo and Teresa. And then after many back and forth discussion, uh, we agreed to set up a training program. Now, mind you, when we started, we don't know what COVID-19 is. There's no mention about that. And, but yet, by the time that we want to set up this training program, we are all in our houses, locked down. So the option is whether we continue to delay to an unknown date um, or we try something new, um, which is online training. And that's what we, are, we, we did. And I think this is like, this is probably the first one in the world uh, that the CI tra practitioner training is done online. Um, because um, as mentioned by Marcelo, usually during the training, there'll be um, uh, a process where you, uh, a, a step where you observe the process so that you can make uh, the improvements, you can identify what are the ways um, visually. But in this training, we have to do everything online. So the knowledge from the people that are doing the work is super important. And also the support, uh, people that are supporting those, those process are, uh, are also very important. Uh, but we are somewhat fortunate in terms of getting support because I have a Six Sigma black belt. My HR manager is trained in Kaizen. Um, our rice breeding platform leader is a green belt, Six Sigma, and also is our finance director. So there's a lot of support uh, to get this thing going. So we started. Um, and um, myself and the HR manager, we function as facilitator as well because we have got some uh, training. I mean, we've got some background in, in this. Um, so we identified three projects um, in the beginning um, that relates to problems encountered in our support to the rice to rice breeding. Uh, each project team has six to eight members, uh, including project leader. Um, so in total, we are tra we trained about eighteen people, um, but they are all not from my platform. They are also from HR team because some of the problems are relates to issues in HR, uh, finance, rice breeding, and sustainable impact platform. And I think this composition of people is important because at the very beginning, uh, there's already an idea of not only doing project, but also um, developing a culture um, within IRI um, of uh, culture of continuous improvement. So I think uh, when that is the ultimate goal, although it will take many years, uh, a long time, you need to have the training um, impacted other other people from other units as well. Um, but the team leaders all came from IRS platform as the projects that we are working on are problems that in terms of the, the, the platform uh, face um, to serve uh, rice breeding. And we basically organize weekly meetings before the online training so that uh, we can define the project uh, properly. Um, so, um, so the projects were worked on during the training. We had um, three hour, I think 14 days of three hour meetings, um, three days a week. So it's stretched out over many weeks. Um, and the uh, team members are comprised of the clients. So they can also provide feedback while the training is going on, because remember, we, we can't go to the labs and to the field. And also the support system. Support system can come from HR or finance, depending on the project. Uh, obviously, we can't complete the implement, implementing the solutions during the training because we are all still um, locked down, uh, most of us at least. Um, and the project continues beyond the training period and we track by based on the implementation action that I will show later. Uh, at the end of the training sessions, we organize a session to present the outcome um, to the stakeholders um, and um, I think one thing that must be um, emphasized here is um, online, uh, for online training of, of this sort, um, the role of the participant is um, very important. Their commitment is, um, is like 
everything to the success of the training. So they must commit to attend all sessions, um, which we at that time had some problems because the training coincide with our wet season planting. So some people need to be involved in that as well. Although most of the institute is lock, is in lock under lockdown. Um, but um, we since we had uh, uh, quite a good uh, team composition. So we work through um, uh, with the teams and basically we help each other out to um, su success of the project. Um, so now let me share with you um, one of the projects that we work on. In this project, the issue is delay in seed shipment. Um, th this happens because sometimes, um, or actually quite frequently, the seed lots do not meet minimal seed health standards due to increasing presence of soil-borne pathogens in seeds. Now, I can already hear some brains clicking, thinking, what is the issue here? So just do some seed treatment, and then the seeds will be on its way. But then you will see later that there are many underlying problems that has resulted in this over the years, so which requires more than just performing chemical treatments on the seeds. So essentially, this is a huge project because all seeds that uh, will be sent to our partners, we'll have to go through the uh, seed health unit. Um, so in order to make the project manageable, we directed our focus onto uh, hybrid rice seeds only. Uh, we use the five lean principles, which are define value, map value stream, create flow, establish pool and seek perfection to solve this issue. I will go through these five lean principles and the tools that we use in each principle. So we start off with defining value. So what is a value um, in any system? Um, I think Teresa explained this a bit, but basically it's uh, what the customer is willing to pay for. Um, here, when you talk about customer, it doesn't have to be in a business context. All work has a supplier and customer um, uh, chain. If you are a breeder, your customer could be the seed recipient. If you're HR, your customer can be the staff receiving your service. So, so, but in the end, what are they willing to pay? That is something that you must determine in these projects. Um, so to define value, we map out who our customers are in relation to the problem that we are trying to, fit, to, to solve. And what are the items that are critical to them and to quality? So this exercise is actually very important in the whole context of continuous improvement process so that we are clear on the expectation of the customer so that the solutions that we strive to find relates back to this. Um, for example, some of the items that are critical to customer include timely delivery, um, um, cost, uh, timely delivery, um, the cost efficiency and reliability. So we also map out what is critical to quality. Basically, this is what is needed by the service provider to provide quality service, such as trained staff, um, effective planning, availability of resources, and so on. So from this exercise, we managed to refine the purpose statement of the project to, uh, to deliver a solution for the hybrid rice team based on integrated field management best practices which will effectively and efficiently reduce the level of pathogen contaminant of rice seeds produced at Erie Los Banos. From here alone, you can see that the team realized already the solution may not only lies in seed treatment, but goes way beyond that. The second uh, lean principle is value stream mapping. Um, this is basically a method to analyze the current state of information and material flow that takes a product or service in our case from the beginning until it reaches the customer. By doing this analysis, we will be able to design a future state which would be more efficient and addressing, uh, in addressing the customer needs. Um, so we start this process by mapping out the whole um, activity that is needed to get the job done using SIPOC diagram. Uh, and this is based on the work uh, flow uh, of activity here. Um, SIPOC is basically a tool that summarizes the inputs and outputs of one or more processes in a tabular form. It is used to define a process from beginning to end. Um, in fact, the SIPOC acronym stands for suppliers, inputs, process, outputs, and customers, which form the column in the table. Now, um, 
in CIPOP just now, we identify the process at a high level. So we look at the steps at a high level, what goes where, and so on. Um, we then take the process, we, we then dive deeper into the process by doing a value stream map. Um, here, we take each step and break it down further to identify the details such as the time that it takes for each step, um, how much manpower is needed, what, what do you exactly do in each of the steps, and that way you can calculate the lead time um, of um, both, in this case, both information flow and uh, material flow. So um, actually, when we were doing this, um, it is a really an eye-opening experience um, because when we were doing this, we keep asking, um, why did we do that? What, why can't we go from here straight to here? And, and so on. So basically, we I mean, almost automatically identify all the activities that is necessary in the provision of the service, but also identify the waste. At the end of the process, we can calculate how much time needed for the whole service. We can also see how much time we can be safe if we eliminate the waste. So a single value stream map can be used to map um, as information flow and product and material flow. Um, and in, in most cases, actually, this can be quite different. So then the next principle is to create flow. Um, flow is basically a key concept in Lean. When you create flow, the goal is to ensure smooth delivery from the second you receive an order, in our case, to the moment you deliver the output uh, to the customer. And one of the best and quite fun way to look at flow is to use a spaghetti diagram. Um, so all these lines, they are spaghettis. Um, so basically, a spaghetti diagram defi is defined as a visual representation of your workflow by using lines to trace the path of an item or activity through a process. So in this example, the spaghetti here are showing you how the seeds move um, in the lab um, during processing. So um, when we did this, it enables us also to identify redundancy, for example here, you know, so many arrows going to all the different places. Why? Uh, why is the system that way? And we also identify um, um, uh, areas where the seats have to travel quite a bit away from, from where the majority of the work is being done. So these are, this are basically redundancies, uh, if you can think about it, or even like transportation um, waste as well. So, Using spaghetti diagram, it helps highlight major intersection points, such as this, that may not be noticed uh, if you're just doing the work day in, day out. So we also use the spaghetti diagram to map the flow of information. In, this, in our case here, three different uh, and independent flows of information is needed to get all information uh, across, um, to get the orders across, basically. So this already tell you there's so much um, a time wastage is happening. Why do you need three independent flows of information when technically one should work? Um, so um, then we also use another quality tool, which is the fishbone diagram, um, which is basically a cause and effect diagram that can be used to track down and visualize the reasons for the problem. Um, the fishbone diagram derives its name because it looks like fish, bo fish with bones. Um, oh, where the head of the skeleton here, um, the, the fish basically is the problem or the effect in our case. The seeds produced at Erie HQ are highly contaminated with different pathogens. Um, and the ribs uh, of the fish denotes categories or classification of causes for the analysis, which can branch out into causes and sub causes. Um, so here we have grouped the causes into people, methods, materials, environment, machines, and measure, measurement. The team then brainstorms to come up with all the possible causes for the effect. Um, after all the possible and potential causes were identified, uh, they were rated. So we take a vote and the rating um, basically uh, is done based on the impact of the cause uh, on the effect. Uh, the rating then will decide the importance and criticality of the cost um, and what we will need to work on next. 
the brainstorming session will continue to uh, rate the different courses and based on the highest rating, the solutions will be proposed. Um, in our training, we also supplemented the fishbone diagram activity with the five whys. Uh, as mentioned, the fishbone diagram helps you explore all potential or real causes that result in a single defect or failure. So you could have a few fish bones if you want, um, diagram. So, um, but um, once all inputs are established on the fish bone, we use the five wise technique to drill down to the root cause. The primary goal here is to determine the root cause of a defect or problem by repeating the question why. Each answer forms the basis of the next question. And in our case, one of the causes to the problem is manpower lacking capabilities. Um, so we start asking, why is this? Uh, and subsequent series of questions and answer leads us to the root cause where the requirements for manpower needs to be updated to include trained workers on specific activities rather than a generally trained manpower. So at, uh, up to this point of the training, we have already created a value stream map, identify some ways to the process, identify the causes to the problems, even dive down to a number of um, root causes. So now we are allowed to daydream. Knowing what we know now, what, what would an ideal, we were asked to, to dream about an ideal process. We now know that we are doing three separate um, or, uh, inputs for one, one order basically. So uh, what would an ideal process look like? Um, so based on the earlier material and information flows that I've showed, we quickly zoom into making the three uh, separate information flow into one um, through a unified OCS request. Now OCS is the finance system used in Erie. Um, this is for this is a system where the clients or customer create um, create order, uh, make payments, and so on. So in this project, three separate OCS inputs were needed for each odd work order. So um, if we can simplify this, um, a lot of time wastage can be eliminated, making the order, work order process much easier. So um, when we think about implementation of this ideal flow, we also realize that um, some information flow between the suppliers, such as the request for specifically trained manpower um, identified during the 5S exercise also need to be uh, streamlined. So we then um, create a more doable future flow, um, which leads to improved uh, work efficiency. But that's not much difference in our case uh, between the ideal flow and a future flow. And now this brings us to the fourth lean principle, which is establish pool. In establishing pool, we consider the customer's perspective on the final product, uh, effectively looking at the operation of the business. Uh, instead of investing in more people, um, as Marcelo says, usually when you have a problem, you immediately think, what, what can we buy to improve the problem to, or to solve the problem? So instead of investing in more people, more material to solve the problem, we look at the customer's true needs to come up with a more sensible model that are cost saving, um, space, time, and resource saving even. So in this project, creating the unified OCS system is establishing pool as when the customer wants a service, which is good quality seats to be sent to their partners, they only need to enter one request, which will trigger all the subsequent information flow towards producing good quality seats. So how do we manage a pool system? The, we created, um, uh, the, uh, basically the best way to do this is by building a workflow. We created four workflows in this sense, uh, so that all valuable information can be recorded and tracked. Um, this first step will help you acquire a full overview of your work process and catch all important signals. Uh, in this project, um, we develop four workflows, which has been identified as crucial to the establishment of the pool system. Number one is the unified um, OCS request, uh, the service agreement with the um, uh, manpower provider, the, the, uh, the training, and also a disease management SOP. So this form our action plan for implementation of the solution. Um, here we identify what to do, um, who will be responsible to drive this action plan, and what is the timeline needed to get it done. 
Um, one example from the action plan is we created um, this disease management sampling plan that detail out the steps to be taken uh, from the sampling point in the field all the way to when the seeds arrive at the seed health lab. Uh, we created SOPs out of this with clear work instruction for staff to follow. Um, we determine what measurements to take at what point and assign a person for each of the section to ensure records are collected so that we know either we are improving, uh, uh, we know how much we are improving and what else to be done eventually. Uh, we created um, a gun chart of activities as a tracking tool so we know who does what, when and what are the target date of achievement and milestones. And um, as I was saying, uh, because we cannot go back to, the, uh, to, to our institute because of this lockdown, um, we created um, a system, uh, if you want to think about it, on how to make sure the project runs despite the fact that we are all at home, only some people are in the field. So beyond training, we arrange meetings with the stakeholders to inform them of the changes that will be implemented. Um, so far, this activity has been very successful uh, because it, it not only opened our eyes, but also the eyes of the stakeholder, which they um, welcome the change that we want to make. Uh, in fact, uh, even uh, make suggestions on how to even improve it further. Uh, we established check-ins with the trainers, um, Gustavo and Teresa, basically at 30 days, 60 days and 90 days interval. Um, we have we established like what I call a Friday afternoon CI hour. Uh, it doesn't happen every Friday, but at least one hour within the week, everybody must get to their team and work on the project. Um, and so I guess at this point, we have entered the fifth lean principles, which is seeking perfection, where we constantly analyze each process uh, and look at elements that work or might not work. And, um, and this happens as well when we meet the stakeholders or clients. Um, and, and also when, when we meet them, we also tighten the flow and deliver exactly what they need. So um, I would say that all three projects um, has given a very positive impact to the way we work. Uh, what I like most is that it makes people think differently. Um, it, it triggers a different kind of thinking. Um, within the three projects, um, some of the achievements, uh, I think is, um, it may sound very simple, but I think it's very significant where we develop work planner and scheduler, we create work packages, um, we improve tools such, uh, related to finance, for example, the OCS, although this is yet to be developed fully, um, but at least we know what was the problem. Um, because I think, um, habits, culture or habits that we have created over the years, we sometimes do not realize that it's taking up time, um, our time, which could be used um, better. So by putting things on paper, discussing about it, then you realize that there are many, there are e things can be done much easier. So um, we have not implemented everything that we want to implement at this point because of this lockdown. Uh, but, I, but for whatever that we have implemented, we know it's working. Um, we have removed whatever ways that we, those that can be removed at this point. Uh, and we are excited to do more things once we can get back um, to the campus. So how do we go from training to creating a culture? Um, I think here, at least in an institute set up, um, a role of HR team is super important. Um, and in Erie, what we are trying to do is work with the HR director to include training on the tools of continuous improvement, uh, build it into the learning and development module that they are developing. Um, we also need, I mean, being an institute that has just started on this journey, I think there's a lot of reminding that needs to be done that if you're discussing problems, um, project problems, smaller problems, um, there's, there's a whole host of tools that, that you can use um, to look at the problems. And I think um, over the years, I mean, at least in my experience, there are favorite tools that people can just um, pick it up and move with it. And for my team, it's the 5S. 
So basically, 5S is a system for organizing space so that work can be performed efficiently, effectively, and safely. This system focuses on putting everything where it belongs and keeping the workplace clean, which makes it easier for people to do their job without wasting time or risking injury. Basically, you don't have to look for scissors or whatever if you have a 5S in place. Um, so the 5S stands for sort, set, shine, standardize, and sustain. So I'll show you some photos of what has been done um, at this point, and I think that's where we'll end. Um, this is our seat storage area, our seat warehousing uh, area basically, where previously you can see here that it's cluttered with boxes on the floor, all kinds of boxes for seat storage, and there's no space at all. You just have to maneuver yourselves uh, around these shelves and so on. And once we implemented 5S, we clean up everything, um, use um, a visually um, a box that, the boxes and labels that are similar and visually stimulating, I think. And then by, then, by that, we also create space so that um, the capacity for the rooms can be increased. Um, this is our seed processing area. We have, um, which looks like this basically, as you can see again, stacks and stacks of boxes everywhere. Um, once we implement 5S, we put in uh, signboards to show people what, what kind of work is done here and only those kind of work can be done here. We put in floor lines to, to tell people where they can, they can walk, where within here is work area as well, so that you don't have, um, um, I mean, you demarcate space so that the right activity can be done at the right place. Um, this is also another seed processing area, um, a different place where, as you can see before this, all kinds of things are just shoved into this, this, the shelves. Somebody even park a motorbike in the area, which we then again get it all cleaned up, um, um, put uh, organize tables there and, and specify what can be done where uh, and, and get the storage area sorted out as well. So I think that's what I can share with everyone at the moment and I hope this has been useful and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, Sharifa for that presentation. Uh, I think we have a lot uh, to learn from uh, the four presenters. So let me thank uh, Gustavo, Reza, Marcelo, and Sharifa for the time and the nice presentation. Now we move on to the discussion and the question and answer session. So if you have any question, you can raise your hand. Uh, myself and Adam will be monitoring that to see who has a question and then you can unmute and uh, ask your question or you can go to the chat box and type in your question. We'll be monitoring the chat box and we'll read out your question and then any of the presenters will, will answer the question. So uh, we are now open for questions. Yes, Ringo. Yes, Dan, thank you very much for, for allowing me to start asking a question. I don't have a serious one, but um, I want to, to acknowledge that in the room I'm with my colleagues here, we were actually listening uh, from the beginning of the, the session up to this moment. And it, it is indeed... Um, worth uh, spending time here or, or listening from the beginning to this moment. And, uh, but now I have one concern here, especially for the last presentation uh, from Sharifa. Um, some, some slides were actually very faint. We could not uh, follow properly. And uh, I would like to ask if it is possible to share with us or the participants, the presentations from all the presenters, the four presenters. And uh, hopefully that will not offend anybody who would like to have those presentations because it's actually a very useful uh, kind of session. We have learned a, a lot uh, 
uh, including my, my colleagues here, I can see them nodding their he heads that um, they agree with me that this was indeed a very important and uh, useful learning session. Thank you very much, Dan. Are you welcome, Ringo? Ringo is a, a partner from uh, Tanzania. So, uh, Sharifa and uh, Gustavo. Yeah, can I, I can I just reply to that one? Uh, sorry about the small writings. Again, online training. Uh, online training, obviously, we can't use um, paper or whatever because everybody's on the computer. So we use Miro. And once we are out of the training process, we cannot. We we have very limited access to our Miro boards. Uh, and I can only get what we did um, for, the, for the presentation to the stakeholders, hence the small. But I can share the, the slides um, with everyone, not a problem. Thank you very much, Sharifa. And uh, Adam, Adam has mentioned through the chat box that uh, they will skip, seek permission from the presenters to share the slides. And once that is ob obtained, the slides will be posted on a link, which is uh, which Adam has put in the chat box. And then there is a message in the chat box. Uh, they need a copy of the presentations on the CD training. Uh, I think Prasanna mentioned that in his opening remarks. So uh, D Dominic uh, will share that link to the presentations i think dominic those are available right yes yes yeah, those so are available uh, dan dan only thing is we need to the the participants need to log into the simit academy web page and then they can access those presentations on high throughput phenotyping or on seed systems improvement or the genomics assisted breeding so uh, Dominic has to circulate to the participants the process to go through CIMIT Academy webpage and register themselves. And once registered, they can have access to those uh, webinar presentations. Then, uh, thank um, you, Prasanna, for that question. Gustavo? Yeah, may I have one comment here? Yeah, so as uh, I think. Risa shared, so there are materials available also in AIB toolbox. It's, it's not the presentations, but the some tools, they are there. So um, please go there, take a look into the tools that we have there, practice. It's, uh, we understand that uh, Marcelo said that, Theresa, Tarifa. It's not one change that for tomorrow is a culture, is a process, but you need to start. We need to think differently. We need to start, take the first step. And um, we really would like from the crop to end hunger perspective, if you could really use these tools to, to understand, hey, this, let's improve this process. Let's, uh, let's practice these tools because it will help you a lot to reduce ways to improve your process and avoid uh, and prioritize. So doing, Marcelo gave good examples on, hey, instead of really going there and, and trying to buy an expensive planter, try to really think on what's really important because cost will impact your program too. You know? let's, let's, uh, no, let's, I'm not saying cost, it's not only the cost, but let's, Identify what's the cause for, for, for your problems and improve your process. So take a look into the tool and uh, yeah, let's, um, we will, uh, from EIB, we will be working uh, close with Leash, Lenin and to support uh, you, the national partners, of course, to improve. And of course, we will not really, this is not the end. This is the, the, the start, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, Hi. Hi, Dan. Bilaro. Okay, yeah. Bilaro. Uh, Bilaro. Bilaro is another of our partners from Tanzania. Please go ahead, Bilaro. Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, 
I was looking at the the concept. Yeah, it's very very interesting. But uh, but uh, most of these examples, uh, I say, it comes from like uh, uh, the private uh, private system, and uh, most of the examples comes from there, and uh, it's a kind of business oriented, and uh, I, I think I, it was good that he. Uh, Sharifa mentioned uh, that the importance of uh, of, of, you, of uh, involving the human resource personnel in the process. Now I want I'm um, trying to look at it how it, it can work with the NAS uh, the NAS system where uh, the setup is uh, a bit different when you look at the for example examples from the CG or the private uh, system like private companies how do how do we structure it in a, in a NAS? so do we have uh, some experience from where it has worked with the, the NAS, especially the challenges that i anticipated thanks so i i i can comment just one thing, and of course, I will ask Marcelo, Theresa, Sharifa to, to add. First, it's not, I think, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, Marcelo, Theresa, Sharifa. It's not a matter of the, if it's a private sector, it's a, it's a, or is a public, or it's a, um, it's a culture, it's behavior. It's Marcelo, it's behavior. It's, it's, it's not only product oriented, this process is how you think differently. So it's not really because you make more money or you develop a better product or you, it's how you do things that you need to do in a way that you deliver the, 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 the your client requests uh, better. So it, it's not really where you work. I understand there are differences and probably this, this Mindset is easier to, to see this in the private company when you, you have a clear deliverable and product. But the concept in, in Lean is much more in behaviors. And so it's understanding the need for your clients and really put effort on things that really add value for your clients. And you have clients too, you know. But I, I ask Sharif, Theresa, Marcelo to, to, to add. Uh, from a, I, I did have an opportunity to work with some public companies here in Brazil when I was a consultant. And it was a very good question. Thank you very much for the question. When you are working with a private sector, private companies, usually you have a boss that says, I want it. And I want it now. So it's an order. So you don't have much of a choice. Even though like Gustavo was saying, you really achieve the change when you're making the lives of the persons involved better. And when I worked with the public company, the message wasn't the boss is asking to. And here in Brazil, public service employees cannot be fired. They cannot. So how to convince those persons to make something different? It's let's try to make your life better. How can your life be easier? So the message is about, I wanted to gain something, speed, saving money, uh, reduce risk. Amazingly, sometimes we were working to reduce risk, to not harm people. And they were not, <laughs> they, they didn't want to change the way they used to work because they were more comfortable. But it's, more than sending messages, it's going there to the Gemba, to the process, observe, live, feel with them. So the challenge that Sharifa said and many others about uh, the, the capacitation through Zoom and other uh, remote tools is huge. It's bigger than we can think about it because the main power of this magnificent change it's about being there in the process of that. What I'm trying to do right now, right now, just after this <laughs> webinar here, I'm gonna be watching a process 
with a, a friend of mine, a colleague, that they're going to be using his phone and show me the images of the work that people are performing right now in the morning here in Brazil. So how can we think in a way to improve the process? It's a matter of way we think, tools, methodology, how to, we can turn and find the way, like water downhill. So the main message is, let's make our life easier and simplify the process. Um, maybe I could also share something. Um, uh, as I was saying, uh, I think even before we started the practitioner training, as I was saying, uh, both uh, plants, which is the rice breeder, platform leader, and myself, we are Six Sigma trained. So um, we want to use the easy tools um, to try to improve some, some things. We, we didn't start out with the project. So as I was saying that I introduced with them some, some easy tools, which is 5S, is very easy. So you could start with that. Just look at um, areas, pockets of um, improvement that you can make. You don't even have to look at your whole uh, center. You don't, it doesn't have to be that big. It can just be like, even just your table, even maybe. I mean, just to get started with some easy tools um, to get going. I think, um, again, um, as Marcelo was saying, Basically, looking at things differently, and that's what I like about the process. Um, and that's what I like about introducing this to my team, uh, allowing them to think differently, looking at things differently, not just we have a problem, let's buy a solution. Thanks. Yeah, and this, this is Teresa, I'll just comment quickly, or um, the way I kind of look at this being a public organization, um, and you have funders, and those funders are your customer. And those and the funders have goals, don't they? They want to see an increase in genetic gain. They want to have a certain number of, of varieties um, with higher yields released to the to their customers uh, um, quicker. They want that adoption rate to speed up, things like that. So if we can um, look at for or the things in your process that are not delivering value to the customer and costing you money or you're using your funding to pay for those things to be done, if we can reduce that, then you can, you can free up that resource of dollars and you can apply that money, uh, that funding to creating, you know, more genetic gain or more varieties, you'll have, you'll have that funding to work with to satisfy that, that customer and ultimately make a difference in the lives of people around the world with solving that poverty and hunger um, need that we have so much of. So that's kind of how I, I look at how does this apply in, in a, a public company. And what we found over the years, of course, is that this whole mindset and methodology applies across all industries whether we're making products or services, and then also in your own life. So <clears throat> most many times we know people, the mindset has really been changed and the culture has really been changed when people are using this in their own life, at their own home, to make their lives better. Uh, thank you, Teresa. There are a couple of comments and questions in the uh, chat box. Is that Question from Frank. Frank is from Uganda. He says, non-value adding exercises. I find it important and interesting in relation to breeding. As breeders, we tend to collect lots of germ plasm, some of it Which, is, which does not add value in discarded, even though it's a parental material. I've mentioned that to Frank, as a breeder, when you get new jump plasm, the thing that something that you can do quickly in your program is to do a quick test course. If you don't see uh, good combining ability um, in the, the jump plasm you have introduced in your program, then you have no use keeping it. That's how I would approach it. I don't know if, uh, somebody has uh, an ex uh, another explanation, but that's what I would do. 
this year is poor, get rid of it. Uh, make, may, then you will have more space in your store. Okay, then um, Siam has a, has a comment. In a continuous improvement, why is it that only lean methodology is given more importance? rather than the, the other methodologies like Six Sigma and the theory of constraints. I wonder who can come in there. So I can yeah, come I in can. too first and Marcelo and can Teresa, I mean, I'm not say, We are not saying that uh, the other uh, tools are not important. Of course, Six Sigma, they have their, their, their importance too and uh, we, we, we are sure that uh, these will come in the, in the specific needs. They, they need to, to adapt that, of course. And uh, our uh, goal with uh, this um, approach in continuous improvement with, with adoption of Lean is to do, because Lean, uh, they, they are simple tools, simple uh, as simple as possible. And we, we need to simplify it starting putting the planting the seeds that we know that will germinate so this is starting simple and then learning but of course the other tools they have their their importance too please uh, marcelo contribute no please teresa you comment first well i'll just comment quickly um i want one thing that i think about when i think about uh all, all the the improvement methodologies, if you will, is many of, this, of the same tools and methods, um, well, those, they exist in, in our world, and we have grouped them together into a brand, if you will, if you want to kind of think of it that way. So even in Six Sigma and Theory of Constraints, we're talking about using some of the same types of tools. It's kind of the way we package them. Um, number two is what, I, what Gustavo said, um, lean is uh, about improving flow and we have so much opportunity to improve flow in so many of our processes and the, the tools are, um, are easy to learn. Everyone is able to participate. It doesn't take a lot of um, time to teach people how to do it and they're not, it's not generally not intimidating. Um, sometimes we get um, to a more uh, complex uh, improvement methodology such as Six Sigma, which focuses mostly on, re on reducing variation in processes, which is extremely important in, in your breeding programs. Um, but um, those using some of the statistical methods and things is, is requires a little bit more training and application and is harder for people. So this way we can we can just touch so many more people, so many more processes, get so much more out of it by, by starting with, the, with uh, improving the flow. And as we do that, I mean, we get effects of reducing variation and, and um, reducing defects and all of that as well. Um, we're just, we're focusing on flow mostly rather than the reduction of, of specifically reduction of vari variation. So Thank I hope you. that helps. Okay. Thank so you, then one, one additional comment. Uh, and uh, in probably as a breeders, I think that most of the participants are breeders. And you also see some approach from excellence in breeding in Six Sigma, talking much more on the breeding schemes, breeding methodologies, and, and, and these will, you will see that too. It's, I, I, it's not, uh, they're not independent. They, it's a, just a different view as, as Theresa said, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, Frank comes back again. He says, I find lean management requiring more of an administrative approach than a scientific approach. In other words, more of an art than a science. Are we set to train our scientists to become good lean-based managers? Uh, just a quick comment here, Gustavo, and connecting but, uh, very little with Teresa and explaining again very amazingly, very good, Teresa. Uh, with Lean, 
we just save more time. It's simpler and we save time. If you save time, we're gonna have more time to approach the more complex problems. And you're right, the lean or any tool or methodology is gonna solve all the problems. Not gonna happen. It don't, we don't need, I, I, I'm very old guys, sorry. <laughs> I remember when we have lean guys and Six Sigma guys fighting each other to see which methodology was were the best. And this is silly. We complement ourselves. You know, it's sometimes we have variation problems and Six Sigma 2 is going to be way better. Sometimes we have a, a, a way, a lot of ways consuming our time when we don't deliver in the proper time. So Lean Tool is going to help us more. And it's not about to make scientists be a lean expert. It's about making everybody be more complete. And we have room for both. If you remember in, in my presentation, the last slide was we were evolving, approaching one problem, starting a program, and then we started to realize that we need to bring more tools, more science tools. Right now, right now I'm developing green belt and black belt training with a lot of hard statistics for the breeders to help them give the next step. It's about a journey and not about the magic that's gonna wave a wand and make everything better. It's a journey. And I, I'd just like to comment too, um, as far as um, science and research and development, that, that's, that's a process, right? Science, we're focusing on processes and, and in science and research, we're, we're, we have all kinds of processes, just like we do in the production uh, facility. And so we're, we're not necessarily needing to train our, our scientists to become good lean-based managers, but just start to think about your process of, your process of research and development. And where are we you know, using resources that we could that aren't adding value to the end game, right? So um, I, I don't know if that helps answer that question a little bit. Um, okay. May I comment too, Theresa? Yeah, I, I, I see uh, why we as an EIB, we put this component in our strategy. This undoubtedly the CJR national programs, we are super in research, but we still see opportunities to deliver uh, the, the, the result to our clients that are the farmers, the small farmers. And how to really get that? I mean, how to really solve that problem? And of course, there are opportunities in different uh, perspectives in science, but also in how, the way we manage our our operations, the way we manage our, our breeding programs. And the, as Marcelo said, as Risa said, we are not really saying that, that continuous improvement will be the only uh, thing to, 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 or only tool to, to improve, but it's definitely complementary with science, with Six Sigma, with, it's a, an additional tool, an additional uh, behavior that we, believe that everyone in CJR needs to have to really bring uh, impact to our end, end customer, that would be the small farmers. So this is what deliver a better variety, faster, and, and this is complementary with science, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Gustavo. We are five minutes over our time, but uh, Let's end with a comment and one small question. The comment is from Sinera. He says, the main point is to use your current resources as efficiently as possible and all, and all we can do, all of us can do that, whether a large company or a small company. It's about having people doing tasks to think how they can do it better versus just doing the same thing as always, okay? Then one last question uh, comes from uh, Demisio in Ethiopia. Uh, he says, uh, what's the difference between con 
the continuous improvement concept and the business process re-engineering and uh, Kaizen. I don't know what Kaizen is. The difference between the continuous improvement concept from business process re-engineering and Kaizen. I'll just give my two cents worth here quickly. Um, first of all, Kaizen is um, a rapid improvement um, method that is, is part of Lean. And it's one of the tools in Lean where we, you pull people together working in a process um, and, and quickly improve the area. They've identified a problem. So we call that Kaizen. It's kind of a, a mini project, if you will. Um, business process reengineering, um, in, in my view, is a different way of branding continuous improvement. So again, we, we see a lot of businesses, you know, looking at their, their all the, their, their back office systems, um, purchasing order to cash systems, and we call that business process management. It's very, very similar to, to what we're doing with, with Lean. So just naming things different, branding them different, focusing on different specific areas. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, Gustavo, any comment? Oh, they are um, Teresa, Marcelo. They are the experts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's end the webinar here. Uh, let's thank our presenters, Gustavo, Teresa, Marcelo, and Sharifa. We thank all the participants. We thank Dr. Prasanna for spending his precious time to give our remarks and staying with us for the, all the two hours. Thank you very much, everyone, and good luck to you in your work. Thank you very much.